So Corey, we're going to talk about the Great Reset. Today is something that seems to be an increasing topic in discussions in the news. Are you talking about Klaus Schwab? Mm-hmm. This guy is a piece of work. So there is video of Klaus Schwab. He was even, you know, they showed on Joe Rogan when he was on there. I think he had James Lindsay on. And so he's got this black thing over. And it looks like he's in a, a some kind of like space suit or some kind of Martian suit. I don't know if it's some part of weird club that he's a part of. But all these people are, they're just weird individuals. And so we're going to go through and cover because there's a lot of stuff to cover on the the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum, and it's basically a club of billionaires that are trying. They've pulled their resources, and they're all basically trying to influence all of the countries of the world to basically submit to some kind of global authority, which obviously they get to run because they're the smartest, most amazing elite in the world, and uh, we'll just have a you know much better planet and. So a lot of this stuff, when you read Klaus Schwab's book, The Great Reset, it it sounds like very, you know, it seems like he's like a do-gooder guy, some geeky, nerdy do-gooder. And he thinks him and the rest of his people that think like him should be running and regulating every aspect of our mm-hmm. lives. And that the nation state, as we know it, is kind of irrelevant. But please do continue. The term first caused an international buzz when the World Economic Forum released a video in 2020 claiming that in the year 2030, you will own nothing. And you'll be happy. Don't you forgot the and you'll be happy part. I did, but you did, you got it. Uh. After the backlash, the WEF deleted the video. So what that means is that everything you have, where you live, you have to rent it. So you always have to work. And if you don't own anything, it's because you can't afford to own anything. So maybe they give you a small UBI. Maybe they give you, I mean, at the end of the day, if people don't have to work or they make it so the economy is so fucked up that you really can't earn a good living, then you're, you're basically a modern day surf. And that's kind of the way these guys think. I'm the king and you're my surf on my land. And I mean, if you look at, was it uh, BlackRock? I think that's, they got $11 trillion under asset management now and they're buying up homes and neighborhoods all over the country. It's, and then renting them out. It's, I mean, I guess a few small big corporations could end up owning a lot of real estate and a Mm -hmm. lot of rentals. And, you know, that's the idea. If you got people that are afraid and stressed You can work them to death and you could run things and they'll have no idea what's going on because they're just trying to survive. And guys like him know this. But it's much better for you if you just live this way. Um, It's going to be difficult in the next couple of years for that. Anyways, back to our story. Regular schedule story. So what is a great reset? The Great Reset was the name of the World Economic Forum meeting held in June 2020 in Davos, Switzerland. According to a Wikipedia summary, it brought together high-profile business and political leaders, convened by Charles, Prince of Wales, and the WEF, with the theme of changing society and the economy following the COVID-19 pandemic. WEF Chief Executive Officer Klaus Schwab described three core components of the Great Reset, creating conditions for a stakeholder economy, building in a more resilient, equitable, and sustainable way based on environmental, social, and governance metrics, which will incorporate more green public infrastructure projects and to harness the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution for public good. The public-private partnership, the perfect merger of state and corporate interests, as Mussolini called it. In her opening speech, International Monetary Fund Director Kristalina Georgieva listed three key aspects of the sustainable response, green growth, smarter growth, and fair growth. 
fair. Those sound like Marxist terms. Pay your fair share. According to the WEF's Great Reset website, the Great Reset is a movement to keep hold of the positive environmental shifts that have happened during lockdown and embed these in society as the new normal. Right positive now, environmental shifts. Because I think uh, emissions drop like 7% or something like that. So in other words, they want to continue to suppress societal industrial output because they like the fact that less greenhouse gases or pollution or whatever. Like I said, I remember seeing a figure, it was like 7%, it was down, and they were pissing themselves. They were so happy about that. They don't care that it's fucking people's lives up because these people live in country clubs and expensive places, mm -hmm. and it doesn't affect them. But the peasants, sad, ah, tough shit. Nothing personal, it's just business. They're just saving the world, of course. Can't make an omelet without make, breaking a few eggshells. Hmm. Right now, we have a small window of opportunity to shape the future we want for our industry and society. Because as we emerge, the pressure to go back to business as usual will intensify. Mm -hmm. We believe that people in our industry have power and influence. But we need people, lots of people, to choose to use it. We need them to grab this opportunity to help shape a society that puts mankind and our planet's needs first and join the Great Reset. To do this, we need to, one, reset ourselves to become agents of change, not just passive receivers of briefs. Two, reset our work so what we create promotes sustainable values, attitudes, and behaviors. That, that's their their idea of sustainable values, attitudes, and behaviors. Correct. This is coming from the website. And three, reset our impact by re-evaluating what we measure and celebrate as success. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. They'll own everything and you'll be their surf. And you have, you have to keep on that little payment treadmill. You always got to be working some bullshit job because it's the only way you can earn enough to survive. But you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. At the launch event for The Great Reset, Prince Charles listed key areas for action, the reinvigoration of science, technology, and innovation, a move towards net zero transitions globally, the introduction of carbon pricing, reinventing long-standing incentive structures, rebalancing investments to include more, though not all, green investments, and encouraging green public infrastructure projects. In an article on Yahoo Finance, international business woman Laura Kohler of Kohler Plumbing Products defended okay. the Great Reset and gave her perspective. She believes the Great Reset is the new standard of different, better, and stronger that should be on every leader's mind. She thinks it's time to reset our thinking to learn and grow. We will never reach a point when all of this, meaning the pandemic, is behind us. The next thing, challenge will come and we must refrain and reset our thinking to see every problem as an opportunity to innovate, to disrupt, or to break through to new heights. As a leader, that ne means... Rahm, Rahm Emanuel, who worked for, um, who was it, Barack Obama, and it was the mayor of Chicago who just failed miserably. He said, never let a crisis go to waste because it enables you to do things that you couldn't have got, gotten done otherwise because it's a crisis. And that's what he's talking about. So anytime there's a crisis, they're going to use it to their advantage to scare the shit out of people and concentrate more power in themselves. That's what all tyrants do. As a leader, that means we're equipping our teams to not only think in this way, but also to act in a new way. To be better and stronger when the next crisis or setback hits. To see opportunity and to focus on the future. What exactly is the World Economic Forum? According to Wikipedia, it is a group of elite business and political leaders and celebrities who meet at annual confab in Davos, founded in 1971 by German engineer and economist Klaus Schwab. Mostly funded by its 1,000 member companies, typically global enterprises with more than 5 billion US dollars in turnover, views its mission as improving the state of the world by engaging business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. 
Yeah, he was just on video, I think in the last couple of years, this was all over Twitter recently, bragging about, and these are his words, how they had penetrated all the different governments of the West and how they had people, their acolytes, people that had gone through their programs that were trained in their way of thinking running governments like Justin Trudeau is a well-known one of them. And, you know, we'll get to that in the story. There's a lot of people in Europe and European positions of power that this guy and his friends have influenced. And he's bragging about how they've penetrated all the cabinets of all the governments of the world. And it's just interesting when you look at the West, how it's just globally, everybody pretty much did the same thing. So mostly known for its annual meeting at the end of January in Davos, a mountain resort in the Eastern Alps region of Switzerland. The meeting brings together some 3,000 paying members and selected participants, among whom are investors, business leaders, political leaders, economists, celebrities, and journalists to to discuss global issues. The forum suggests that a globalized world is best managed by a self-selected coalition of multinational corporations, governments, and civil society organizations, which it expresses through initiatives like the Great Reset and the Global Redesign. It sees periods of global instability, such as financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, as windows of opportunity to intensify its programmatic efforts. Yeah, it's, you know, everything's global. They're, these are the, the globalist type people that they don't really have any loyalty to their countries and where they came from. They consider them citizens of the world, if you will. And they're at, at the highest levels of success and influence, and they think they're the smartest people around. The rest of us are a bunch of useless eaters and stupid morons that are too dumb to know what's good for us, and therefore... People like him, him and his friends, should be running and regulating every aspect of our lives. So, yeah, they want to control everyone's lives, but they're not elected officials no. at all. I, they have no accountability. So they can do whatever they want, and they won't get in trouble. Yeah. And it's all the it's all the wealthiest, pow- most powerful people in the world. So it's all the people where you have all this power. So it's like, oh, we've been collecting our power our whole life and not giving it back. But if you just give us the rest of the little power you have left, we promise we'll give you the power back and take care of you. Yeah. Are we really supposed to believe those same people? No. It's weird. It makes no sense to. Um, The WEF has something called the Young Global Leaders Program that trains leaders to pursue the WEF's agenda. The program seeks to identify, select, and promote future global leaders in business and politics. Attendees at the school must apply for admission and are subjected to a rigorous selection process. There are currently about 1,300 graduates, and the list of alumni includes those who went on to become leaders of the health institutions of their respective nations. That's interesting. Business Week's Bruce Nos... Okay, let me... Nussbaum. Okay, let me see if there's any other words. I don't know. Okay, Nussbaum. Business Week's Bruce Nussbaum describes the young global leaders as the most exclusive private social network in the world. The organization itself describes the selected leaders as representing the voice for the future and the hopes of the next generation. Many have become presidents, prime ministers, or CEOs. See, they're, they're all self-appointed. They, these guys believe they're entitled to this because they've reached a level of success in life. A lot of them are trust fund babies, especially when you look, look at, like, the, you know, now all of them are deceased, but the, the Rockefellers, David Rockefeller, I mean, they were all trust fund babies. These guys never had a struggle for anything in their life. Everything was handed to them. And so they literally have no connection to middle class regular people and so they don't understand what they're going through that's why like we were covering the thing with the truckers in canada what's his name ford um that you know the big obese guy you know their attitude is just everybody needs to do what i say because i say so and that's how these guys think and nobody elected them they've just appointed themselves you know these uh, these other people here and how they view themselves the 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 whole globe didn't you know most of the people around the world didn't even don't even know who most of these jerk-offs are and but because of their connections and who they're all the different people that they support 
they're influencing legislation and politics and media and propaganda globally because it's the same message like the you know i think we'll probably get to it but like the build back better thing it wasn't just joe biden saying that it was like leaders all over europe were saying build back better the world economic forum was saying build back better people in the european union were all saying it all in lockstep even you know the sissy prime minister in canada same thing build back better you know, they're repeating like a bunch of robots. You know, it's a slogan. It's propaganda. There are all these people that are running things. They're, they're all aligned with that because they, that's their club of, that's their clique, if you will, of people they hang out with. These are the people that are influencing everything that happens to us. And that's one of the things, I can't remember who said it, but this quote goes back a couple thousand years. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't have any interest in politics because politics still will take an interest in you and the and another one I, I think i can't remember who it was but it said the penalty good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men is that plato aristotle or plato or tacitus i, I can't remember it was one Socrates. of them said that. that's a couple thousand years old i mean these thousands of years ago they knew these kind of tyrants these kind of people so first up on the list, so these are people that are in positions of power. And so when Klaus Schwab brags about how we've penetrated all of the cabinets of the different governments around the world, these are, I'll just, we're just going to go through a list. And this is not everybody, but so Klaus Schwab and the rest of his friends have spent billions and billions of dollars over many decades influencing the most powerful people in the world to their goals, to their values, to their ideology. They, you know, at the end of the day, they've been ideologically indoctrinated to whatever it is that Klaus Schwab and the rest of his friends believe. And so, you know, whatever you observe in life, you're going to participate in. And so if these people have bought in and then you hear like the Build Back Better was just one example, how like all of them in lockstep all over the world were saying the same fucking thing. And you're like, oh, well, that not that interesting? So the first one is. Jeffrey Zients, he's the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator. Uh, Stefan Bensel, he's the CEO of Moderna. Oh, Moderna, the, the vaccine company that's never had a product in history until their vaccine. Isn't that interesting? Huh, imagine that. Jeremy Howard, founder of influential lobby group Masks for All. Oh, Interesting. Leanna Wen, zero COVID CNN medical analyst. Oh, she's a piece of work. You can see her. She's on CNN now going, oh, the science has finally changed. But the reality, when you look at the cases, they're, they're skyrocketing. The problem is what everybody's saying, is, which is obvious, is the poll numbers change. Joe Biden has a, uh, what was it, a 54% disapproval. Whenever a president has had that kind of disapproval, they just get crushed in the midterms. And so that's the real reason, you know, her saying the science has changed. You know, it's obvious that she's a Marxist that thinks like the rest of these, because again, she's part of their little clique. So number five, we got Eric Feigl Ding, zero COVID Twitter personality. Gavin Newsom, our favorite per governor of California. So I guess he went through the program in 2005. You know, Gavin Newsom's one of those guys that is, you know, locked, basically made California a prison. Locked, you know, confined people. What did, what did uh, Elon Musk say? Confined people to their homes or locked people in their homes or something to that effect? Uh, Devi Shridhar, British zero COVID professor. So these, these are all people that are in powers, positions, influence. Jakinda Arden, the prime minister of New Zealand. You know, she's been balls to the wall, locked down the country, wouldn't let anybody in. What, if you don't get vaccinated, you're not able to leave the home. And you could just you could just see when she talks, this woman, the way she moves her head, it's like she's just like, you're going to do what I say. You know, she is a, she's a, a self-avowed socialist, Marxist. And you can tell she fucking loves it. She loves having control. But they're starting to open up now. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, he's totally on board with, I mean, the strictest lockdowns. Aust Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz. So, I mean, German Chancellor An Angela Merkel, she's been in, in their little club since 93, apparently. 
So she just stepped down, um, and they had a, had a change of politicians. But German Health Minister Jen Spahn, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, who's a leading proponent of global vaccine passports. It's just, you can see their goals, they all think alike. You're going to do what you told, you fucking peasants. Jean-Claude Juncker, former Prime Minister of Luxembourg and President of the European Commission. He was nicknamed the, the Joker. I, I wrote about him in my book, Mastering Yourself. He was a piece of, this guy was drunk all the time. What a piece of work. And Elena Baerbach, the leader of the German Greens. Current U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Oh, look at that. Imagine that. Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, which we haven't seen much of Jack Ma since he got into trouble with the CCP. He got a little too uppity, and they he's been very quiet. During the pandemic, several WEF global leaders played prominent roles, typically promoting zero COVID strategies, lockdowns, mask mandates, and vaccine passports. This may have been an attempt to protect public health and the economy, or it may have been an attempt to advance the global transformation agenda outlined in the Great Reset, or perhaps both. All of these politicians who were in office during the past two years favored harsh responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and considerably increased their respective government's power. It's worth noting that at a conference at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government in 2017, Klaus Schwab, the founder and leader of the WEF, boasted, What we are very proud of is that we penetrate the global cabinets of countries with our WEF young global leaders, like Trudeau. So who is Klaus Schwab, a German engineer and economist, was Professor of Business Policy at University of Geneva from 1972 to 2003. Company during World War II. Information on his parents is scarce and mostly on anti-Schwab, anti-globalist websites, claiming his father was a Nazi as chairman of arms manufacturer Escher Wise and Company during World War II. There are unconfirmed claims Schwab's mother was Jewish and abandoned him with his father when he was an infant to flee to America. He was raised by his German stepmom and never talks about his birth mom. What arguments are advanced in Schwab's book, COVID-19, The Great Reset? The book was published in July 2020, only six months after the pandemic began. It's almost like he had the book ready to go. You don't write and publish a book in six months. It doesn't happen. I mean, I I did my first book, and I think it took me three or four months, and it was me and my ghostwriter, and then getting it all uploaded. It's like, phew, that guy had been working on that thing. Is it post-its? People have, people have, it? have joked, you know, even though Jen Psaki said it by accident. Instead of the pandemic, they call it the plandemic. Plandemic. There was a clip on, you know, in one of the White House briefing, she was, you know, she was just talking and then she said the, the pandemic. And obviously there were a lot of memes. People grabbed that and made a lot of clips out of it. <laughs> she said the quiet part out loud. But, you know, you look at that, the book comes out six months. It's like, come on, man. That dude had that book ready to go. There's no way. The book posits we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution and that the digital transformation has found its catalyst with COVID-19. Because of accelerating technology and international interdependence and the risk of a grand conflict coming out of a global catastrophe, such as a global pandemic, the only solution is greater global governance and cooperation and pushing a green recovery to avert potential grand conflict. Some of the big ideas from the book include, in the macro reset, the pandemic is accelerating remote working, automation, telemedicine, drone delivery, digital currency, etc. There is need for more comprehensive governance for the collective good, 
that's from collectivism, Marxism. It's at the end of the day, when you look at the history of communism, where it came from, it's basically a bunch of wealthy kids that had nothing to do or born with a silver spoon in their mouths. When you look at Engels and Marx, these were privileged kids that came up with this idea that, oh, we're going to have this, we're going to take care and unite all the work. Workers of the world unite. We're going to take care of you because you're being exploited. And the reality was they were going to continue to get exploited because once they had communism, him and his friends would be running it. And that attitude of the global elite has always been part of it. Like when you look at like the quote I was reading earlier about the penalty good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. When that's what happens is because you have these people that have nothing to do. They're incredibly wealthy. They can buy anything they want. And they're trying to have some kind of significance, some kind of purpose in life. And that's, you know, when you look at communism, it, it's a, it's a scam by the elite to concentrate even more power in themselves. And, and it's like you just – when you read the words and you listen to them talk, they feel entitled to run everything because they feel the world will be a better place. And the words they write, it sounds like they're, they, they're, their hearts are in the right place. They want to do good things, but they really, really want to run everything. And that's another reason why all, you know, all these people – a lot of them don't like the idea of private gun ownership. They don't like – they really don't like the, the Second Amendment. And when you look at the body count from communism, collectivism, socialism around the world, I think somewhere around 150 million over the last 100, 100 years, it's been tried and failed everywhere. And it, it's the same thing. You get the elite that basically you, – you end up with a mafia elite running the country. Like you look at like the Chinese. It's, it's a clique of the elite that are running everything. When you look at Venezuela, you get a criminal mafia elite that murder their way to the top. So you get the most conniving, ruthless people that rise to the top in those systems. And our form of uh, democratic constitutional republic that we have in the United States is the best form of bad government that humanity has ever come up with because it distributes power everywhere. We're a union of 50 individual countries because our founding fathers understood and dealt with people like this because these kind of people have always been around for human history. And so the reason they created a country, uh, a uh, democratic constitutional republic that's comprised of 50 individual countries is to distribute power as much as possible all the way down to the local level and keep as little possible power concentrated in the central government. They wanted the states, the governors who were the presidents of the states, to deal with their individual states and their individual states' affairs. And they wanted the federal government to deal with the international affairs. Because when you concentrate all offices in Washington, as they refer to it, you're going to end up with communism, socialism, collectivism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. I would say these guys, they use a lot of Marxist principles, but they're really corporate fascists. They, again, that's the perfect merger of state and corporate interests in, in cahoots to basically run and regulate every aspect of our lives. This, this battle has been going on all throughout human history, and it always will be. And they have no problem guys like Klaus Schwab have no problem lying to your face about anything because they believe deep down their heart's in the right place and they're doing the right thing every tyrant evil every single tyrant that's existed in history they all believe they were doing the right thing regarding health monitoring this could make surveillance by contract tracing and tracking essential components of the response and any future response the micro reset will force every company in every industry. Let me hold on. Let me stop you there. So what's interesting about this, about how, because a lot of people were complaining about the digital passports and the vaccine passports, is it would basically create a way where different government organizations can track everything that we do through our cell phones. And so there was a documentary done that Aaron Russo did because he got to meet. I can't remember which one of the Rockefellers it was. And this, this, you can watch this clip. Just If you just Google or, or go to DuckDuckGo and search for Aaron Russo and chipping humans, they were talking 20 years ago that they wanted to chip everybody and it, the, everything would be digital. They have digital cash. And if you don't comply, <laughs> your chip just gets shut off and then you can't buy or sell anything. And obviously a lot of people that are religious say, well, the, the chip – 
or the tracking really is the mark of the beast because I think part of it, what it says with the book of revelation or something like that, the, you know, you wouldn't, if you didn't accept the mark, then you wouldn't be able to buy or sell. So anyways, it sounds kind of like, but I mean, when you watch the Aaron Russo thing and all these things that he talked about in that short documentary, like I said, it's, it's all over the internet. You can watch. It's really interesting. And these guys are all matter of fact talking about all this stuff. And I mean, it's 20 years ago and now it's happening. It's, it's rolling out. And that's why, because a lot of people are aware of these videos and these people have made very clear what their plans are and they, they're very proud of them and they brag about them all the time. So it's right out there in the open and their attitude is if you're too stupid to know what they're doing, then you deserve what you get. That's how they think. It's nothing personal. It's just business. The micro reset will force every company in every industry to experiment with new ways of doing business, working, and operating. This requires things like localizing supply chains, stakeholder, capitalism, and giving lowest paid workers a better deal. So stakeholder capitalism is part of his public-private partnership, which is basically partnership between government and corporations. And that is a definition of fascism because that's what F Mussolini said it was, the perfect merger of state and corporate interests. And so like we were talking about earlier, you look like BlackRock, $11 trillion under management, and they're buying up real estate all over the place. And so if they own most of the property, then low-income, poor people, middle-class people, they ain't going to be buying anything. They're going to be renting everything. And if you have to rent from them, you don't comply. They kick your ass out. What are you going to do? You can't afford to buy anything. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Doesn't it sound great? Mm -hmm. It's clear big tech came out the biggest winner from the pandemic by showing the most resilience. An individual reset has been forced from stresses of lockdown, though it's lead to increase in mental health problems. It also forcing people to pay more attention to the importance of nature and well-being to consume less. Because of the uncertainties caused by complexity of the connected world and velocity of technological change and with questions of fairness being brought to surface by the George Floyd protests, the Great Reset is a prerequisite. Worldwide movements are demanding a better future and calling for a shift to an economic system that prioritizes our collective well-being over mere GDP growth. Collectivism is Marxism. Marxism always leads to concentrated power in a mafia elite. You can study history. It's happened everywhere you concentrate power. I would, you know, when you look at the Chinese, the Chinese aren't really even communist anymore. They're more corporate fascist. So they've kind of adopted, you know, they've morphed from a communist country into a a fascist type of country where you have the state interest and the corporations because the way it's written any business that's a chinese business you're basically the government always has access to all of your information your client files everything and if you're a chinese company doing business outside the country then the chinese are, are the government is entitled to all of your data on everything you're doing in the other countries and that's why people are you know, looking at TikTok one, that's basically a spy device. Because if you think about it, you know, because people have gone through and analyzed the code and there's a lot of things in there that are grabbing information from your phone that it shouldn't be and sending it somewhere and asking for information that it shouldn't be asking for. And that's why when Trump was in office, he was saying he was going to ban it because it's basically spyware of the, the Chinese government. I mean, think about it. Everybody's got TikTok. You can learn everything about them, their behaviors, what they're into, their relationships, who they're connected to. And you can plot all that stuff out and with computers and track it. Use AI to sort it. The world is at a crossroads and only the Great Reset will lead to a better world, more inclusive, more equitable, and more respectful of Mother Nature. Only the Great Reset will lead to a better world. So in other words, only their ideas, only their way of life will make planet Earth better. Just give us all your power, control, power over everything. And you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Trust us. 
There is an interesting review of the book from Springer Publishing, an American publishing company of academic books that concludes, Their argument for the necessity for a great reset strays from the small or marginal changes they describe. Instead, it functions as an entire re renegotiation and re-envisioning of the social contract. They ultimately advocate for a substantial, if not complete, socio-political economic overhaul without offering any specifics as to how this could be achieved. They fail to do so, even while arguing that the overhaul is not only necessary, but also in need of expedient execution. Yeah, they do it through guys like Trudeau and half of his cabinet that are that have the same policy positions. They're pushing the same agenda. These guys literally have penetrated all the governments of the West. And that's how they're getting this stuff done. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, this is what they're doing. They're legislating your freedom out of existence, right under your noses and laughing at you. That's why all of them, like uh, Boris Johnson, all of them, you know, they were partying without their masks on. He, Gavin Newsom's hanging out in a restaurant, partying without his masks on. And then they get caught and they just lie about because they don't give a shit about this stuff. It's, it's all part of their shared agenda. Despite their explicit position on the benefits of doing so, they ultimately risk undermining their aim given the opacity of how to achieve it. In sum, beware of those who roar. This is the way. What do those yeah, who wait, going about with that, like the alibi of the tyrants is the welfare of the people. Yeah. So like they just promise all these great, beautiful things. And then that's just how they do it. That's how they kind of coax people into it. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Like they could just like, oh, pro make all these promises and never deliver on it. And then they're in power and they completely secure it. And you're kind of already screwed. That's why Joe Biden has a 54 percent disapproval rating. He, you know, everybody on the left is getting red pilled now because they're like, man, this guy's not doing what he promised. He said he was going to raise student debt. He didn't do any of that. You do any of the things. It's like he gets in, he's, he says, I'm going to do this. Then he gets elected, and then he just does a completely different agenda. The only thing he did with student debt was to uh, postpone the, the debt. That yep, was and it. Trump had already been doing that. Yeah. What do those who claim the Great Reset is an anti-globalist conspiracy theory say? In a BBC article dismissing the idea as nothing to worry about, the BBC asked, how did it go viral? It explained that these conspiracy theories began circulating online around the June 2020 launch, but only gained significant traction later in the year. The phrase started trending on Twitter when a video went viral showing Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at a UN meeting in September, saying the pandemic provided an opportunity for a reset. Oh, imagine that. A reset. Trudeau said the same thing, and Klaus Schwab was bragging about how he had penetrated his government, and Trudeau was one of his guys. That's just swell. I'm sure they have the best intentions at heart. Totally. On left-leaning news opinion website The Intercept, liberal author, author and social activist Naomi Klein wrote an article titled The Great Reset Conspiracy Smoothie. She claims... The Great Reset is an attempt to create a plausible impression that the huge winners in the system are on the verge of voluntarily setting greed aside to get serious about solving the raging crisis that are radically destabilizing our world. Yeah, a lot of the crises have been created by these jerk-offs. In expressing her concern that messaging conflating necessary climate change measures with the Great Reset was benefiting big global companies, Klein wrote, This messaging is gaining traction not because people are suckers, but because they are mad, and they have every right to be. Lockdown policies have demanded months of individual sacrifice for the collective good without providing the most basic collective protections to keep families from slipping into starvation and homelessness, or to keep small businesses afloat. Meanwhile, this woman leans left. Meanwhile, trillions have been spent to backstop markets and bail out multinationals, and pandemic profiteering is rampant. It's good to be a gangster. Is it any wonder that so many find it entirely plausible 
that the same elites who expect them to swallow all the coronavirus-related sacrifices while they party in the Hamptons and on private islands would also be willing to exaggerate the risk of the disease to get them to accept more bitter green medicine for the common good. Let them eat cake, as Marie Antoinette said. So when all of the peasants were starving and were pissed off at her, she's like, let them eat cake. Well, eventually, karma caught up with her, and it didn't turn out too well for her. What do anti-globalists claim about the Great Reset? Broadly speaking, they claim the Great Reset is that a group of world leaders, an elite represented by the World Economic Forum, orchestrated the pandemic to take control of the global economy and reorganize it in a more sustainable and equitable fashion to implement something akin to world socialism. It's global fascism. They'll call it socialism because it sounds better, but it's, it's corporate fascism. It's the oligarchs and the trust fund babies running and regulating every aspect of our lives. In an article on American policy, a pro-liberty, anti-globalist website, the writers claim, the Great Reset details a plan to create global interdependence, both an economic and a societal reset, detailing the return of big government. In addition, it details a geopolitical reset designed to change our system of government, an environmental reset mainly based on the threat of climate change and the continuing threat of pandemics. It even calls for an industry reset, which is a technocrat's way of saying banning capitalism and free markets. And finally, it outlines our coming mental health issues and well-being that will be affected as we cope with the shock of the destruction of our society through the Great Reset. Part of the thing is, is that you have people like Bernie Sanders who don't really know what the fuck's going on, talking about how capitalism doesn't work for everybody. And what we really have is rigged market capitalism because all of these people and this clique here that think like them, these different oligarchs, just like she was saying, that they get bailed out. And so they're they're basically in control of the printing press and where the money is diverted to. And whoever controls the printing press basically controls the society because you can basically spend however much money you need to spend and pump it into different companies or sectors of the economy to influence so you can get the outcomes that you want. And so you end up with rigged market capitalism and people don't know any better that, that are struggling. They go, oh, capitalism is a problem. If we just had socialism, that will solve everything because everybody will be – the whole society will just work when you want. And you can do things you love and then the rest of the time you can read books and poetry and stare at the clouds. Right. Another thing too is uh, it's like uh, – You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Yes, that too. Um is it's privatized gains and public losses. Yes. So one of these comp- mega companies fail, oh, well, we're going to have to take all the tax money and bail them out. It's socialism for the oligarchs is what it really goes on. As pointed out in an article on right-leaning Breitbart News, it's clearly not a conspiracy theory. Just as the devil's greatest trick was to persuade the world he didn't exist, So it suits promoters of the Great Reset for people to believe they're not serious about their plan, even despite the fact that every last detail is spelled out on the World Economic Forum's website, and in its tweets, and on the cover of Time magazine, and in books like the one WEF founder Klaus Schwab published this year titled COVID-19 The Great Reset. What do middle-of-the-road voices think? Left libertarian comedian Russell Brand released a video on his YouTube channel addressing the issue. Asking whether the Great Reset was a conspiracy or fact, Brand observed that despite any conspiracy theories, it's plain and observable what's happening. There's a transfer of wealth. There is a transfer of power. There are more prohibitive measures being placed on ordinary people. This we can see without believing in a shadowy cabal. He thinks positive change will come from decentralization of power, the opposite of what the WEF wants. He definitely has to take Viagra. (laughs) (laughs) We're all making observations. Okay. (laughs) What does Klaus Schwab himself say? Here are some quotes. 
A great reset is necessary to build a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. He also says, the global health crisis has laid bare the unsustainability of our old systems in terms of social cohesion, the lack of equal opportunities and inclusiveness, nor can we turn our backs on the evils of racism and discrimination. We need to build into this new social contract our intergenerational responsibility to ensure that we live up to the expectations of young people. To read on, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. This global pandemic has also demonstrated again how interconnected we are. We have to restore a functioning system of smart global cooperation structured to address the challenges of the next 50 years. That him and his great his friends get to uh, run, of course. The Great Reset will require us to integrate all stakeholders of global society into a community of common interest, purpose, and action. A global government. Additionally, it appears those who want to address climate change see the Great Reset as one way to do it. Here's a quote from President Biden's climate czar, John Kerry. This is a big moment. The World Economic Forum is really going to have to play a front and center role in refining the Great Reset to deal with climate change and inequity, all of which is being laid bare as a consequence of COVID-19. Well, it was the, the consequences were caused by the politicians locking everything down because our economy was booming. And then they, you know, and when Trump was in office, he agreed to all the damn lockdowns. And here we are two years later and most of the country is still locked down except us in the free state of Florida. A technology news blog called The Sociable that analyzes how technology transforms society published a detailed timeline of the Great Reset concluding that the Davos elite said they wanted a global reset of the economy many years ago. They role-played what would happen if a pandemic were to occur. In May 2018, the WEF partnered with John Hopkins to simulate a fictitious pandemic dubbed Cloud X, to see how prepared the world would be if ever faced with such a crisis. In Sounds October, like a dry run. In That's why they call it the pandemic. In October. <laughs> oh my God. In October 2019, the WEF once again teamed up with John Hopkins along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to stage another pandemic exercise called Event 201. Huh, imagine that, Bill Gates. Huh. And now they're saying that the Great Reset ideology is the solution to the pandemic, and oh, it must be enacted quickly. Oh, yeah. Here's your problem. Here's our ideology. Solution. Oh, yeah. Wow. We just have to have this solution that? all ready to go. What a coincidence. The Great Reset is a means to an end. Next on the agenda is a complete makeover of society under a technocratic regime of unelected bureaucrats who want to dictate how the world is run from the top down, leveraging invasive technologies to track and trace your every move while censoring and silencing everyone who dares not comply. That's what they, they love the Chinese model. They just... They love Xi Jinping. They love the way the Communist Party runs China, and they want to run the rest of the world that way. And they believe they'll probably be able to do it with the Chinese. But at the end of the day, under communism, everybody eventually ends up in the gulag, comrades. Especially those guys. They're the useful idiots. The ones that... Because the communists, when they take power never keep those guys around like the Klaus Schwab's of the world. They're, they always get lined up against the wall as well once their usefulness, because then they, when they find out that they're not going to be running things, they're not too happy about it. And they become very dangerous to the regime. Um, all right. yeah, I think it was uh, Pol Pot. I think it was, after, you know, he took, he was the uh, leader of the Khmer Rouge, took over Cambodia and I think when he first took over there, he had like 10 lieutenants, and within a year, eight of them were dead. Hmm. So the people that he took power with, he didn't share power with. That's what happens. The Great Reset appears to dovetail with UN Agenda 2030, 
What is United Nations Agenda 2030? The mission statement is a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all people and the world by 2030. The UN's website says it calls for development strategies that result in resilient societies where people are safe from chronic threats such, such as abject poverty, hunger, disease, violence, and repression, and protected from sudden and hurtful disruptions in their daily lives. So I guess the locking everybody down didn't qualify as a sudden disruption in their lives? Huh. The UN's goals for sustainable development include... Almost like they say one thing and do another. The UN's goals for sustainable development include no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, reduced inequality, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goals. As long as they run everything, that just sounds great. I'm sure they won't abuse their power. So, Corey, in your opinion, what do you think of the Great Reset? I think Nuremberg Trials for the Elite. I think, I think Klaus Schwab and the rest of the people are trying to do the things he's trying to do should be brought up in trial. I mean, especially Gates. I mean, he had a big influence on all these lockdowns and destroyed millions of lives. I mean, it didn't affect him. He's flying on private jets. He ain't wearing no fucking masks. He don't care. So is it a conspiracy theory or, so, or something else? Well, I mean, what, what defines a conspiracy? It's a group of people working together to achieve some kind of an outcome. So I guess technically it qualifies as that. But typically you throw a conspiracy theory at it and people go, oh, well, and, you know, just like the UFO thing. You know, my whole life and even my parents is like, yo, UFOs are a conspiracy theory. And now you got the Department of Defense going, oh, yeah, by the way, hey, we got some alien craft that definitely were not produced in this world. And uh, admitting that UFOs are real, they don't, most of them, at least they say they don't know really what they are, what their intentions are. But, you know, just 10 years ago, the government's official position was, uh, it's a conspiracy. It's swamp gas. And now everybody's like, oh, yeah. It's like the biggest non-news event was finding out that UFOs were, the government finally admitting they were real. So do you think we should worry about it or should we welcome it? The UFOs? No, the Great, the Great Reset, Reset overall. I don't want anything to do with it. Fuck them. The Constitution of the United States of America is still... There is more people trying to come to the United States of America than any other country in the world. That's a fact of life. So if you want to figure out what's the best place to live, well, where are most people trying to get into? It's the United States. More people want to come to the land of opportunity is what it was always called when I was growing up. And what you see now with the cultural Marxism, the critical race theory and people in government, people in the news saying, oh, all the founding fathers are racist, the Constitution is outdated and should be done away with. And since the many of the founding fathers owned slaves, well, we should pull their statues down and not talk about it. And basically what you do is as you go through several generations of kids, the younger kids never learn about the Constitution. All they grow up in here is, oh, the founding fathers are a bunch of fucking racists. And so if, if you've delegitimized them and, you know, 40, 50 years from now, the kids that are growing up and becoming adults, they won't have any affinity or no connection to the Constitution. Like, oh, yeah, it's an outdated document. Everybody knows it's an outdated document. Just... So eventually, with enough time, you can literally propagandize the future generations to have no ties to the past. And then because they've been working on this for over 100 years. You know, it's very well known, very well documented to concentrate more power. And so you get successive generations of these families that work in this. They all believe in this ideology that they'll they call it one world, as David Rockefeller referred to it. And it's like, again, it's like we we're talking about earlier. It's just, this is the same battle that's been going on all throughout human history. It's you got you got two types of people. You got people that want to be left the fuck alone and you got other people want to tell everybody else how to live. And it's the same battle. And you get the elite, the people that made it to the top. They think they're the best. They think they're the smartest. And 
they should be running and regulating every aspect of people's lives. So this is not surprising to me at all. And so that's why, you know, for me, I believe in self-reliance. Because if you're self-reliant, you don't need these fucking jerk-offs. But if you're dependent, if you're broke, if you're in a scarcity mindset, then what they're selling, just like socialism, that's why it sounds so good to people who are struggling. Because it makes sense. Oh, well, I'm, the reason I'm poor is because, you know, the evil rich people have all the money. Like Bill de Blasio, the former mayor in New York, said, oh, there's plenty of money. It's just in the wrong hands. And so people like them, it's like if you're part of the club, you're good. But if you're not part of the club, then they can seize everything of yours. Seize your property, seize your, your bank account if you don't comply with what they want, if you're not on board with it. So concentration of power is never good. So I am absolutely want nothing to do with it. And these people should all be put on trial for what they've done. You know, through what, what's happened in the pandemic, it's... They should be put on trial for it. Millions of people are dead. Millions of families are destroyed. They've ruined millions of businesses around the world. And there's nothing's happened to them. Well, a simple solution is you need a stable money supply. You need a stable and elastic money supply. And cryptocurrencies do that. I believe we should also have a digital U.S. dollar as well, along with a, a euro and every other type of currency. There should be multiple currencies and multiple purposes because liberty exists, like Lord, Lord Acton said, liberty exists in the distribution of power, tyranny and the concentration of it. And when you have money, the power to print money concentrated in two small hands, then you get a boom and bust cycle that's been, you know, because when the Federal Reserve came into existence, they promised us we would, this boom and bust cycle would be over. We'd always have a nice stable economy. And we've had nothing but boom and bust cycles and people like this have just manipulated the boom and bust cycle to their benefit to accumulate more wealth because all the, the, the people that are paycheck to paycheck, when stuff like this happens, they lose their homes because they can't pay their bills anymore. And then guys like this come in and buy their properties up at you know pennies on the dollar, their businesses up at pennies on the dollar and concentrate more wealth, more power okay. within themselves. And so by having a stable money supply, it can help offset or eliminate the problems created by the central bankers. If we're able to use like Dogecoin or Bitcoin or um, Monero or any of these other um, type of uh, she the Shibu coin, any of these other type of coins, you create all kinds of different money. So you don't need a bank. You don't need the government for cash. There's, there's plenty of people that have cash that need things done. And so you're not totally dependent on one type of money. So I'm all about for the distribution of money. That will solve the boom and bust cycle if we have a stable and elastic money supply. And we need to have a justice system that works. You can't have all these people in government doing all these crimes that are pretty obvious, like the shit that Hillary Clinton and the rest of her clan pulled off and just have them skating on it because that's the kind of thing that erodes the people's trust in the government because if they don't think people can get justice then they want to start taking justice into their own hands and if people feel like voting in elections is pointless then they're not going to vote anymore and that that's not good and people have this is like what Dwight D. Eisenhower said politics should be the part-time profession of every American you should know what is going on and what is being done in your name. And so, and the other thing is information, like the quotes are on the back of my books, enlighten the people generally, and tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. If most people did that, if people were self-reliant, if they learned how to earn a great living by simply developing their own value proposition, that's growing their reserve of knowledge, developing their gifts or skills and their talents, learning ba the basic stuff of self-reliance that I teach in my books. If people understood that and we had a stable money supply, it wouldn't really matter a whole hell of a lot what the government did. And if people were enlightened and they knew what was going on and they had trustworthy media, then they could elect people and hold them accountable. And the ones that don't get them voted out of office. And because these guys, I believe they've overplayed their hands. And when you look at Joe Biden, it's got a 54% approval and that's why California and everybody else is trying to really quickly open back up and, you know, change, move the goalposts and say, oh, well, the science changed and we're going to go back to normal now is because they're actually getting crushed in the polls and the people are sick of it. And so it's like the, you know, we were talking about earlier about the Joe Rogan, the 
um, Dr. Malone, Dr. McCullough. I think that was kind of the the tipping point. That was the kind of aha moment. And, you know, all the people that we went through in here that like the one woman who's on the left, she's a leftist and she sees the danger to human liberty that that Klaus Schwab and the rest of his his oligarchs that he's in cahoots with are a threat to that because they want to concentrate power within themselves so they can make the world the way they want. So I, I think the dude should be locked up. I think he's committed crimes against humanity, just like Fauci and all the rest of them. Uh, I want I want to and there's enough of this out there and there's enough there's millions and millions of people that have been hurt by this and they're pissed off and the pendulum's starting to swing back the other way and that's kind of what you're seeing with the truckers protests and if you gum up the logistics even the jerk off that is you know klaus schwab he gets his food from trucks and so if the trucks stop moving and the logistics stop moving the truckers have all the leverage. They have them actually the most leverage in in the country, in all the countries of the world. If you stop moving goods and services, the people are going to get upset real fast, and they're going to turn on the people that cause this shit really fast. That's why when you look at Canada, how now 54% of Canadians are like, they, they want the shit gone. So I believe we're moving in the right direction. 